Well, if there is a hall of fame for architects, I'm pretty certain that Diotti Salvi is not in it. <laughs> he was a, a famous architect back in the 12th century. And in 1173, a small town in central Italy, they hired him to design a bell tower that would stand next to their local cathedral. And he came up with a, a magnificent design, but I'm sure that the town later regretted their choice of architect because he gave no thought, totally underestimated the depth of foundation that would be needed to support this structure. Okay, so, so this bell tower w was destined to have walls, eight foot thick marble walls. It would go 180 feet into the air. It would weigh a total of 14,000 metric tons. So how deep do you think the foundation had to be? 10 feet. That's what he called for, 10 feet and on unstable ground. So the construction crews, they were uh, up to the second story of what would eventually be a seven-story building when the bell tower started to lean, and so they stopped work. And for the next 199 years, crews would start work, and then they'd stop. And then they would start, and then they would stop, not sure if it would fall over at any moment. Now fast forward to 1990, uh, the angle of tilt was so precarious that they called in some engineers and they had to buttress the, uh, the foundation a bit and the tower, leaning tower of Pisa, you ever heard of that? Which is what we call it today, it's still standing, but barely. <laughs> now in Matthew chapter seven, Jesus tells a story about how important it is that we build our lives on a firm foundation, a foundation that will undergird our character, our relationships, our vocations, our sense of mission and purpose in this world, our self-esteem. You know, we need a firm foundation. Would you turn with me to Matthew 7? That's going to be our text for today. Matthew 7. Now, what is the firm foundation that Jesus says we ought to build our lives on? Uh, well, if you know the title to the series, Bible Every Day kind of gives it away. So I want to ask you, as, as we start today, is, is God's Word the firm foundation in your life? Is this the foundation that you're building on every day? Every day. Now, if your Bible is open to uh, Matthew chapter 7. Let me give you a little background here. Jesus tells this story at the end of his famous Sermon on the Mount. Okay, this is uh, the sermon that launches his earthly ministry. You can find it in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has just announced that he has come to earth to introduce a new kingdom. And then in the Sermon on the Mount, he lays out, th th this is what a kingdom participant, this is what a citizen of my kingdom ought to look like. This is how a citizen in my kingdom ought to behave. And he tells, uh, outlays uh, this description, outlines this description in the Sermon on the Mount. And then he concludes with this story. Now, Jesus is speaking to an audience that is made up of Jewish listeners, and they have a common hero, a guy named Moses. You heard of Moses. 1,400 years before Jesus' day, Moses had led their ancestors out of Egypt, out of 400 years of slavery in Egypt toward the Promised Land. Along the way, they stopped at Mount Sinai. Moses went to the top of the mountain. He met with God, and then he came down with God's clear instructions for how God's people should live. Uh, we call them the Ten Commandments. So here, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, Jesus is uh, drawing a page from Moses' playbook. He's doing a Moses thing. He goes to the top of a mountain, it's now Mount Sinai. In fact, it's kind of a sloping hill on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee, and he takes a seat. And he teaches people, this is what God's people ought to look like. This is how they ought to behave. If you're a citizen in my kingdom, this is what you need to do. And then he concludes the Sermon on the Mount with the words I'm about to read, the story that concludes the, the sermon, beginning at verse 24. Follow along in your Bible as I read. 
Therefore, everyone who has ears, uh, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, I want you to circle the word. If you've got your Bible open in front of you, circle the word authority in verse 29. Jesus taught as one who had authority. And I want you to keep that word in, in mind for just a moment here. As I, I said when I opened up, we're, we're, we're beginning a three-part series called Bible Every Day. Uh, we're asking, in fact, all of our community groups, we're asking if you will track with this series as your curriculum for the next several weeks. So thousands of people involved in uh, almost 300 community groups across our four campuses. This is go going to be your study for the next several weeks because this is our church's biggie goal for the year. Every year we choose a mega goal. And this ministry season, the mega goal is, is Bible every day. Our goal is to uh, motivate you to begin to build your life daily on God's Word. Now, now why, why is that so important? Because this is God's authoritative book. Jesus taught as one who had authority. And see, we're living in a culture that kind of, kind of resists the notion of authority. Have you picked that up in the news? Okay. We, we like to think of ourselves as uh, the authority for our lives. You know, follow your heart is our, our, our mantra. You know, do what seems best to you in the moment. Our patron saint is Elsa of frozen fame. You know, she throws off her cape and she lets down her hair and she belts out the song. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Okay, is this your theme song? You probably can't sing it as well as Elsa, but you know, we're, we're living in a day where everyone is following their own heart. You know, doing whatever seems right in the moment with your money, your kids, your entertainment choices, your business decisions, your dating life, what, what, whatever. You're acting as your own authority. And Jesus warns you, if that's you, you're headed for a crash. You're headed for a crash. Better to build our lives on God's authoritative word. How do we do that? Here are four steps we need to take from Jesus' story in order for this to happen. Step number one, believe it wholeheartedly. Believe it wholeheartedly. We're not going to build our lives on the Bible unless we believe that this is God's Word. God's Word. This is no ordinary book. When we read it, God speaks to us. Do you believe that? You know, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, he says, all scripture is God-breathed, comes from the mouth of God. Okay, the Apostle Peter, writing in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, he says, when the human authors of each individual book of the Bible, when they sat down to write their book, they didn't just record their own personal thoughts. No, Peter says they spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You know, if you sit down and you read from the Bible cover to cover, you will come across a phrase almost 4,000 times, and God said, or the Lord spoke to Moses, or the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. See, the reason that the Bible is authoritative is because it comes to us from God, the ultimate ruler of the universe. Believe it. Believe. Now, if you struggle believing this, you know, I wrote a little uh, volume several years ago, wrote a four-book 
set called Bible Savvy for Moody Publishers. And the second book of the series, Foundation, I lay out some of the evidence for this, this claim that this is a supernatural book, that, that this is God's word, that this is unlike any other book you can pick up and read. You know, for starters, this was Jesus' testimony about the Bible. Jesus believed that the Bible was God's word. You know, if you go back in the Sermon on the Mount a little earlier than the passage we're looking at today, Matthew chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus tells his listeners that anyone who obeys the commands of this book is going to be great in the kingdom of heaven. You know, all through his earthly life and ministry, Jesus was constantly quoting from the Bible. Whether he was combating Satan in the wilderness or he was hanging in agony upon the cross, the Bible was constantly coming off of Jesus' lips. Here's some additional evidence that this is God's authoritative word. You got Jesus' testimony, you got fulfilled prophecies. Now, if you were following the Bible Savvy reading schedule with us uh, over the course of this past summer, we went through the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel was a government official uh, working under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the superpower of its day. And yet Daniel prophesied that one day Babylon would be overthrown by the kingdom of Persia and that the king of Persia would allow all Jewish exiles to return to their homeland. And that years later, Persia would be overthrown by Greece. And it all went down just as Daniel prophesied hundreds of years earlier. See, who, who but God tells the future with absolute accuracy, makes predictions like that? This is God's authoritative book. Let me give you one more piece of evidence. And by the way, if you pick up that book, Foundation, I cover a bunch of different evidences substantiating that this is God's book. But I'll give you one more here, Transformed Lives. You know, hardly a week goes by at Christ Community Church, even during a pandemic, when I don't get a text or an email or a phone call or a note from somebody who's been diving into the Bible with us here at Christ Community, and they say, this book has changed my life. You know, restored my marriage, broken an addiction in my life, given me freedom from debt, provided me with wisdom for making decisions, given me peace and tranquility in the midst of upset in our world. They, they attribute it to this book. They credit this book with having transformed their lives. You know, li listen to me, friends. Every day, all day long, we hear the voices of those who speak to us with so-called authority. You know, the promises of a politician, the sales pitch of an advertiser, the dating advice of a good friend, the diagnosis of a doctor, the directives of a boss, the forecast of a meteorologist, the latest stats of the CDC. We are, we are bombarded by the voices of people who profess to speak to us with authority. But there is someone who wants to speak to you. Someone who holds the universe in his hands. Someone who uniquely created you, intimately knows you, passionately loves you. The God of all wisdom. He's speaking to you through his book, his authoritative book. Believe it wholeheartedly. Number two, hear it daily. Hear it daily. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 7. Let me reread the opening verse of today's scripture to you, verse 24. Uh, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus says, hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Okay, in order for the Bible to become a firm foundation for our lives, we have to engage with it. Whether that's hearing it taught in a sermon, as Jesus' listeners hear, or studying it together once a week in a community group with brothers and sisters, or reading it on a daily basis, God's word won't become foundational in our lives. It won't lead us and nourish us and shape us authoritatively if we're ignoring it. 
You know, what, what if I told you today that I discovered a new diet plan over the summer? I was looking for a way to lose some weight, to get in shape uh, in terms of my, my physical health, so I went looking for a diet plan, and I, you know, I didn't want to do Nutrisystem or Jenny Craig or uh, South Beach or Whole30. I came across a new one online. It's called the Once a Week Plan. Have you heard of it? Okay, so it, it is really simple. You don't have to know a lot. You just eat one meal a week. That's it. Right? Now, now, wait, come on, you're laughing, but it's a good meal. I mean, it's an all-you-can-eat sort of meal, a lot of, of nutritional foods and whatever. How many are going to try that diet? See, nobody's going to go for that. But, but you know where I'm going with this, don't you? This is what we do many times as Christ followers with God's word. We get one heaping helping of it once a week. We go to church, we hear the pastor preach, and that's it for the week. How are we going to survive spiritually on that? Now, many of us have said, well, you can't. That's why I joined a community group. Okay, so now you're up to two meals a week. You say, well, yeah, but my community group requires some preparation. There's a lesson that you have to complete, okay? Many of us who have a lesson to do for community group, we do it the night before our group meets. So we're up to three times a week. How healthy are you going to be physically on three meals a week? How healthy are we going to be spiritually? Where's the vitality going to be if it's three times a week that we feed on God's word. You know, the, the prophet I, uh, Amos said in Amos 8, verse 11, he said, there's a famine in the land. And it's not that people are starving from lack of food and water. It's that people are starving from the lack of God's word, Amos says. Now, friends, this is why we designed the uh, Bible-savvy reading schedule four years ago. Daily Bible readings, they could be done in you know, 10 to 20 minutes and they'll take you through the entire Bible in a matter of four years. Now, we are just finishing up this four-year period. In fact, this month, we're coming to the conclusion of our four-year Bible-savvy reading plan. And so we're celebrating the fact that many of you have made it through the entire Bible, some of you for the first time. I mean, even if you picked it up, just months ago, you're now becoming a regular Bible reader. And what I want to tell you today is that we're beginning a new four-year four stretch. So we have updated the Bible Savvy Journals, and uh, we have redesigned the schedule for kids. Kids get their own journal. It's called the Epic Journal. And we heard from parents that some of the daily readings were a little too long for the little tykes, and so we've redesigned it with shorter passages for the kids. And this is what we're going to use in the midweek uh, uh, plan for middle school and high school students as they gather. It's going to be the Bible savvy reading schedule. And we're asking all of our community groups twice a year for a four years, a four week stint each time. Would you take your group into the Bible savvy reading schedule? You know, instead of doing another curriculum twice a year, just do Bible savvy for four weeks so that everybody gets acquainted with how to read God's word on a daily basis. We're even going to do in fact, I think it started this last week. We're doing a weekly podcast with a couple of our pastors who are just going to be talking through one of the passages that we read during the week, helping people get an application out of it for their lives. We are determined to help you become a Bible every day Christ follower. We are determined to help you build this spiritual foundation in your life to make God's word your daily authority. Will you accept the challenge? Okay, I, I read a disconcerting article online recently. It was, it was entitled, Bible Reading Drops During Social Distancing. It was a, an article that described the uh, research of the Barna Survey Group. Uh, the Barna Survey Group has been taking a survey for the last 10 years of people in this country, their Bible reading habits. Okay, and what they discovered is that recently the, the biggest drop in Bible readers has taken place over the last six months. In all, all the 10-year history that they've been looking at it, the biggest drop, we've lost 13.1 million Bible readers over the last six months. 
You say, well, that's kind of crazy. I would suspect in a time of crisis, uh, you know, there would be more Bible readers. And it actually started that way. When we first sheltered in place, Bible reading spiked, but it was short-lived. You know, it soon dropped dramatically, except for one group. You, You know what group continued to read the Bible? In fact, the numbers went up for this group. It was the people who had a family member or friend die of COVID. Now, isn't that interesting? So so if something really, really, really bad happens to us, then we turn to God's word with regularity. But if it's only kind of bad, then we neglect God's book. Well, at Christ Community Church, we are going to do everything we can to buck that trend, to, to help you become a Bible everyday person. Let me tell you about another recent survey I came across. This was done by the group LifeWay Research. Uh, LifeWay Research uh, likes to survey professing Christ followers to uh, discern patterns in our spiritual disciplines. So they they sent out a survey and they asked people, well, how often do you pray? And, you know, how often do you share Christ with others? unbelievers? How often do you give generously to the Lord's work? How often do you serve others, care for the poor? And so they get a whole list of spiritual activities. And what they discovered in their most recent survey is that there's one activity in particular that's a catalyst to all the others. They found that the more often people do this one activity, the more likely they are to do all the others. What do you think the one activity is? Read the Bible every day. Read the Bible every day. God's authoritative word. Believe it wholeheartedly. Hear it daily. Number three, obey it diligently. Obey it diligently. God's word is not authoritative in our lives just because we read it. Now listen to me. You can read the Bible every day. You can study the Bible weekly in a community group. You can hear it taught on weekends here at Christ Community Church and still have it uh, have zero impact on your life. So let's go back to Jesus' story in Matthew 7 because I want to compare the two builders in this story, okay? The wise dude who builds on rock and the foolish dude who builds on sand. Please note as I read these verses what, what the two builders did like and what the two builders did differently. Okay, verse 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Okay, there's the wise guy. Drop down to verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Now, what did the two builders do alike? Call it out, what'd they do? Yeah, they both heard God's word. You know, they read their Bible every day. They joined a community group. They listened to Pastor Jim's sermons, both builders. They even took notes during the sermons. What did they do differently? Well, the wise builder put God's word into practice, and the foolish builder didn't. You know, this is why the seven guys who join me on Thursday mornings for my men's community group, this is why they know they're going to hear the same question from me week after week. In fact, multiple times in the course of our weekly gathering. See, we're following the Bible Savvy reading schedule, and all week long they keep a log, they fill out a, a journal, just a you know, paragraph a day of an insight and an application from their reading, and they come up with lots of good insights. And they know they're going to hear from me great insight, but they also know the question that's coming up. So what are you going to do with it? How are you going to put this into practice in your life? What's your application going to be? See, moms and dads, it's, you know, it's not enough that you read the Bible every, every day to your kids, although that is a tremendous place to start. In fact, if you're a parent and you've been reading the Bible to your children, God bless you. You are a hero. But don't stop with just reading God's word. Draw a life lesson from each passage and then help your kids figure out how they're going to put it into practice in their lives. You know, if they're old enough to write, then have them write it down. Write down this application in their epic journal. 
Now, we're going to talk more specifically about how to do this, how to get applications out of your daily Bible reading in a couple of weeks, how to help your kids do it. Two weeks from now, but today I just want to emphasize how important this is. You know, the epistle of James says in James chapter 1, verse 22, and just remember, James was a a half-brother of Jesus, so I have a sense that he heard his bro, Jesus, say this repeatedly. James says, James chapter 1, verse 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now, why does James say that, that we deceive ourselves when we only listen to the Bible, when we only read it or, or, or study it? Because we think, we think we've done something spiritual. We think we can check off a box. We, we think this is going to help us grow. It's going to make a change in our lives. But James says it's not going to produce a dent unless you do something with it. Now, what keeps us from doing the Bible after reading it? What what keeps us from converting what we've read into a life application? I was musing on it this week, and I I came up with four reasons. Maybe these are just applicable to my own life, but maybe you can identify with these. Reason number one, we're misdirected. We've been led to believe that the goal of Bible study is Bible information. Okay, which is why some of us not only join a community group, we're in like two or three Bible studies, and we listen to preachers' podcasts and uh, Christian radio during the week, and we pick up Christian books that delve into biblical topics and so on, and we're gathering information. But the goal is not Bible information. The goal is Bible transformation. The goal is Bible transformation. Here's another reason we often don't move from reading and studying to actually actually doing it. We're hurried. So some of us have carved out time, say early morning, to uh, read the Bible before we go to work or we start into school on our laptop or uh, we run out the door for shopping or wh- whatever it is we've, we've got on our calendar for the day, hundreds of things to do. So our Bible reading is like six or seven minutes long and we barely have time to scan the passage. We're just in a hurry. Or thirdly, we're we're lazy because it takes some mental energy, it takes some spiritual energy to come up with an application for our lives, doesn't it? I mean, Bible reading is kind of passive. Bible application requires active participation. You, You read the text and then you muse on it a while, you turn it over in your mind, you underline some phrases, you look for repeating words, you put a check mark in the, in the margin of your, your Bible, you ask the Spirit of God repeatedly, now Holy Spirit, what is it you want me to see from the text today? Okay, it requires some energy on our part to get to the doing of God's Word. Lastly, the reason we don't get there, oftentimes, it, you know, we're just rebellious. I'm embarrassed to admit to you that sometimes when I read the Bible, I know exactly what God is telling me to do for the day, but I don't want to do it. And so what I'll do is I'll find something else in the text that I'm already doing, and I'll write that in my journal, because then I get a gold star for good performance. Yeah, you're laughing because you do it too, right? But are we looking for the stuff that we're not doing yet, the stuff that's hard to do, the stuff that has to do with how we use our money or how we uh, handle sex or where we're at in relationships and forgiving people who have abused us or any number of things? I don't want to see that. Are we open to God's Spirit speaking to us? Let's not deceive, deceive ourselves. We are not building on God's Word. The Bible is not becoming our daily authority if we're merely reading it. The foolish builder did that. You know, building on the rock means putting what we read into practice. Get it? Good. I've been waiting months to say that. God's authoritative book, obey it diligently, forth and finally experience it beneficially. I am a huge fan of baseball history. 
Okay, when I was a kid growing up, I had a baseball card collection of over 6,000 cards, uh, many of them dating back to the early 1900s. And in addition to my card collection, I, uh, for years, I read two or three baseball biographies every year. Just finished a biography this summer on Mo Berg. How many have heard of Mo? Yeah, didn't think so. Like nobody. Okay, Mo Berg was a third string catcher back in the 1920s and 1930s in, in MLB, but he gained fame because he later became a spy for the Americans in World War II. So his biography is entitled, The Catcher Was a Spy. You get it? Do you ever have to read for high school literature, The Catcher in the Rye, The Catcher Was a Spy? Okay, forget it. Some of you are wondering, well, you know, if you've got such a love for baseball history, I assume that you have been to Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame, and the answer is no. Now, one time I tried to get there, okay, I, I was speaking for a conference in upper state New York, and my parents-in-law had joined us for the week, and one afternoon that I had free, I said to my father-in-law, hey, Cooperstown's like an hour away, you want to go? And so we jumped in his car, and we were 20 minutes on the road, and his car conked out. Now, a little backstory here. Uh, my father didn't believe in following the owner's manual of his car, never read it, never paid any attention to it, and that meant that he never changed the oil in his car, and the oil had completely run out, the engine had seized up. In fact, eventually, he had to leave the car in New York and have its engine replaced and then go retrieve it about a month later. So I never got to baseball's Hall of Fame. I'm not bitter just a little bit. <laughs> you say, what does this have to do with Jesus' story about the two builders in Matthew 7? I'm glad you asked. Let's take a final look at the story. Matthew 7, verse 25. This is a description of the dude who built his house on the rock. So he represents the person who builds their life on God's word. They follow the owner's manual. Okay, verse 25. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Okay, drop down to verse 27. This is a description of the dude who, who built his house on the sand. So he represents the person who does not build their life on God's word. They don't follow the owner's manual. Don't put it into practice. It says, the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, don't miss what I'm about to say. It is not obvious, listen, it is not obvious if a, a house is built on rock or sand until the storm comes. It is not obvious if you have been building your life on God's word or not until the storm comes. But the storm will come. Storms come in various shapes and sizes. Your spouse wants a divorce. Whoa, that's a storm. Your company downsizes you out of your job. That's a, a storm. Your test this week shows that you've got COVID. Your best friend betrays you. Your struggle with depression is getting worse. Your candidate loses the 2020 election. Your college diploma doesn't get you a job. Your teenager is caught doing drugs. Your car is in an accident with you in it. I mean. How prepared are you for the next storm of life? See, they not only come in various shapes and sizes, they most often come with no warning. No warning, total surprise. And so if your house doesn't have a rock foundation, listen, if your house doesn't have a rock foundation, it's a little too late when the storm comes to try to slip one under it. If you have not been building your life on God's word, when the storm comes, it's a little too late to slip that foundation underneath it. See, the time to become a Bible everyday person is today. Before the next storm hits. 
Some of you are saying, well, it's too late. I'm in the middle of a storm right now. Well, let me say you missed your opportunity for a foundation this time around. But become a Bible everyday person anyway, because the next storm or the escalation of the storm you're currently in is right around the corner. So begin to experience the life stabilizing, the life enriching benefits of God's authoritative word. Believe it wholeheartedly. Hear it daily. Obey it diligently. Experience it beneficially. Now in just a moment, I'm going to close in in prayer, and then we're going to do something really important. So, you know, don't slip out if you're watching online, you know, don't go get a glass of orange juice from the fridge right now. Hang with us for just a few more moments here. But I do want to give you a couple of real practical applications as we wrap this up. And you've heard them in the course of the sermon. Uh, One is if you're not in a community group yet, you know, our community groups are going to be doing this study for the next three weeks, Bible every day. Jump into a group, go online, hit that, you know, that tab, join a group, or find a group, I guess it's called. And, and even if you don't want to be in a permanent group, you could be in a discussion group for the next three weeks. Find a group, check it out online. The other thing I want to recommend to you is that you start today becoming a regular Bible reader. So if you don't know where to begin, you know, on our CCC app, uh, check out uh, Bible Savvy, and we will give you a schedule. Now, I I said we're just finishing up the four-year schedule this month, so we're halfway through the book of Revelation. If you're familiar with the Bible, but you've never been a regular Bible reader, feel free to start right in the middle of Revelation with us. If you're not familiar with the Bible, don't follow that schedule, okay? Because I think you'll get a little confused if we drop you right into the middle of Revelation. So I'd recommend for you, if this is a first time cracking the binding on God's book, start in the Gospel of John. Okay, look for the Gospel of John, a short biography of Jesus. And for the next several weeks, just read one chapter a day. Then you'll be able to jump into the regular reading schedule in a month or so. Now, let me pray, then we're going to do something really special. Uh, Lord God, thank you for your word. God, it's just amazing to us that you not only inspired people to write exactly what was on your heart, but you have preserved your your word over the centuries. People, uh, People have tried to stamp it out. People have tried to to burn it, to uh, keep it from being accessible to Christ followers, and they've just had no success. Your, Your word is indomitable. Your word is a firm foundation for our lives. And I want to pray for uh, those who are gathered today, either on campus or watching online, who've not yet become a, you know, a regular student of your word. Would you, would you help them get started, God? And, and for those of us who've been delving into your word for years, but maybe not made a regular practice of finding an application and doing what the word tells us to, to do. Help us to become doers of your word and then watch it transform our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.